Thank you for that introduction. Um, I just want to have a quick uh, show of hands as to how many people consider themselves to be more on the artificial intelligence side than on the geo side or the AI side. Um, how many people on the earth science and geoscience side saw that here? Okay. All right, so I'll talk a bit more on the geoscience side um, because I'll pursue that, you know, quite a bit more about AI. Um, so normally both these fields have been really seen kind of high drive, but um, in recent years there's been like an influx of data, but also um, data sets which are getting labeled, um, therefore, we can apply machine learning techniques. And I work at um, Mila, uh, which is the Quebec AI Institute, uh, for um, Professor Joshua Bengio, um, who along with uh, Jeffrey Hinton and Jan Lee Kun won the Turing Award. And uh, we have a great team doing visualizing climate change. Um, I'll talk more about that project. Uh, but we also have collaborators um, at McGill, uh, Microsoft Research, so Jennifer Chase, who heads um, the New England, New York, and Montreal labs. Um, she's involved in the project, alongside um, Berkeley Labs, uh, Northeastern, the American Meteorological Society's AI Committee. Um, there's a new track within that uh, yearly conference called Emmy Runner. So, um, how could we propose to perhaps bridge gaps between both these fields? Um, geoscience, on the one hand, is, um, I guess, the focus so far, more or less, within the IPCC has been about um, making uh, predictions of future climate change, but um, more along the lines of uh, validating and proving whether climate change is um, true or not, um, right? So it doesn't go to the extent of uh, necessarily giving you very personalized uh, predictive analytics about what to do about climate change. Um, AI, on the other hand, um, has that capability. So, you know, Facebook, um, all kinds of other uh, tech companies, their focus, um, what AI provides, like the scalability and personalization. So how could we perhaps imagine a future where um, we can have personalized planetary scale um, predictions or what we could call as planetary intelligence. Um, you have to bridge gaps between data sets, um, have some kind of physics guided framework, uh, which then informs um, artificial intelligence across different uh, challenges, and at the same time, bring it to the people. Um, so that's about creating some kind of visualization framework, because it's really hard to know um, to the general public to be able to relate uh, what some of these graphs uh, produced by the IPCC necessarily mean, right? So you want to do something slightly better than that to help the public. Um, and yeah, we're facing various challenges. It's not just about climate change. Um, there's several challenges. The Stockholm Resilience Center um, calls it nine planetary boundaries. Um, apart from, I guess, stratospheric ozone depletion, which is in the safe zone due to the Montreal uh, Protocol. Um, more or less, the others were in like a, a high range of uncertainty. And uh, one source of uncertainty, I guess, is uh, one major source of uncertainty is uh, cloud feedback effects in the geoscientific uh, models. Um, and recently, there's been uh, there's been, I guess, certain conferences which have said that um, they've been underestimating the impact of climate. So in fact, uh, climate change is, the impacts of climate change are perhaps worse than what they're predicting. Um, so it's important to know uh, and reduce the source of uncertainty because depending on how much the uncertainty is, uh, we'll, we're looking at crossing the two degrees Celsius uh, threshold, which will be devastating for the planet, uh, with a range of around 20 years or so. So we want to reduce that to know like, more precisely when it might happen. But more than that, I guess we want to know, um, as is the theme of this talk, uh, how perhaps um, artificial intelligence uh, can be used to tackle climate change. So this is a paper I've been uh, involved in alongside um, several other uh, co-authors. It's like a white paper which provides um, a vision for how we can tackle climate change across different um, 
sectors, but also uh, different um, methodologies within uh, machine learning. So from you know, electrical systems all the way to uh, tools for society and education to um, CO2 removal, uh, going with artificial intelligence, like topics like computer vision to reinforcement learning um, to causal inference. Um, and some of this work uh, was leading up to the, um, there's this new track called Climate Change AI happening at the international conferences on machine learning um, and other conferences as well since then. So this year, New York will have a Climate Change AI track, uh, perhaps in future ICLR. So this is quite new in that um, AI conferences haven't really had like a climate change uh, track so far, or a geoscientific track. And yeah, just to speak more specifically about um, the Mila project, um, I'm in Alden alongside my colleagues. So the goal of this project is to build a tool um, that will help the public understand and visualize climate change in the future. So say you type in your um, home address in Google's Street View, um, can we create uh, a future depiction of uh, what it would look like after, um, say, there's a flood, right? Um, so can we maybe make predictions of this? So here you see different images. Um, so this is basically the output from a generative adversarial model uh, trying to, adversarial network trying to um, create uh, renditions of flooding um, on households just based on the picture of the home itself. Um, and there's different ways to approach this. We initially started with uh, something called CycleGAN. Um, this just tends to change the entire image, so there are quite a few more artifacts. Um, and we moved across to Instagram, which is focusing on specific modification. Um, uh, so it limits the modification to specific uh, regions. And then we're seeing more success with um, a model called Munit, which uh, can entangle both um, style and content. So we need uh, climate predictions as well, or more precisely in this case, um, hydrological science predictions. And um, there's a project happening within the Google crisis response team where um, they're working on uh, locations which are most prone to hydrological disasters. Um, but this is like short-term forecasting of floods, right? Um, in our case, we want people to know um, and bring the future closer in their minds um, 30 years from now. So the same model can't necessarily be applied because you need to run it um, in a warmer world. So we're trying to collaborate with people and if there's people in, uh, in this audience who are working on future predictions of climate change um, and we need this to be at household scale. So scalable, uh, scaling down or creating high resolution models is really challenging. Um, primarily because of uh, the lack of proper digital elevation maps. Um, but there's also a lot of potential for machine learning here. Um, so there's a, a team at um, JKU uh, in Austria uh, where um, they used a scalable machine learning model for um, creating like a hydrological uh, model which can then create predictions of future discharge which can then be plugged into um, a hydraulic sorry, a hydrodynamic system, like the one which uh, Google has developed. But right now we're just in our early stages and what we have is um, flood frequency maps. So uh, there's studies um, in nature uh, by the EU Commission and Post Time Institute uh, who are, whose work we're uh, leveraging off where um, they provide uh, predictions up to uh, one square kilometer. Um, but we want to get this down to household scale, which is going to be challenging. But yeah, beyond this, there's plenty of other um, ways in which we can bridge uh, gaps, perhaps, between uh, geosciences and AI. So this is one project I'm working on um, with an intern, where uh, the goal is to, within the cryospheric sciences, uh, to create um, next frames of uh, satellite data sets to see how uh, glaciers and uh, future ice melt will change. So, uh, using similar techniques uh, as stochastic video generation uh, to try and predict like future frames of uh, satellite data sets. Uh, it can also be applied towards um, aerosol prediction. So this is another project. 
Um, so atmospheric aerosols are also a large source of uncertainty in uh, climate models, um, and they also seed clouds. Um, but additionally, uh, they're kind of, you know, they're particulate matter, right? So it's um, important for air pollution monitoring, all of that. Um, so the number of ground stations around the planet, uh, which can uh, provide decent labels for um, satellite remote sensing or um, geoscientific model outputs of aerosols is uh, currently limited. Um, so how can we perhaps uh, bridge that gap by um, creating predictions and locations where there's uh, limited uh, ground truth? So creating a framework where you can learn uh, based on limited ground truth. So there's uh, stations around the world called Aeronet, and um, as model input, we use uh, like an uh, image of a satellite reanalysis, it's called. So it's a combination of both um, models and satellites, um, and we feed that into a convolutional neural network. Um, there's another project by Berkeley Labs where they, um, similar to with an image net where you have localization and detection of um, objects. Um, perhaps can we use that to uh, draw bounding boxes around um, atmospheric rivers and hurricanes? So this is the, um, on the right, is the output from uh, IPCC um, model, um, which gives you like the integrated column water vapor. So can we create bounding boxes um, around where this is? So rather than getting a meteorologist to do it, uh, getting AI to just like know it precisely where it might happen. Um, yeah, so putting all this together, we need good label data sets as a starting point. Uh, so there is um, a project uh, called EnviroNet, uh, which um, alongside American Meteorological Society's AI committee, um, we uh, are in the process of launching, and this will be um, an open repository of uh, labeled uh, data sets across uh, different planetary challenges. Um, and we'll also have challenges associated with, with these different label data sets. And yeah, just uh, to kind of wrap up, um, you need, you know, there's different planetary challenges. Um, each of those, uh, if you can think of it as a framework, um, just as with ImageNet, um, like a repository of geoscientific um, image data sets. Um, and if we can use like a physics-guided framework to tackle uh, some of these challenges um, using machine learning, so if we can break down um, geoscientific challenges uh, in a similar framework as machine learning challenges, so from super resolution um, and downscaling to uh, semantic segmentation to tracking um, hurricanes or next frame kind of prediction uh, to detecting and localizing and drawing bounding boxes uh, to creating, emulating, and forecasting. So I touched on each of these topics. Um, but additionally, if we can then go that one step further to create uh, better visualizations, it will um, also impact uh, people. And then we can think of this as perhaps AI for Earth. Um, but until that point, there's a lot of challenges to be overcome. And we can't just say, you know, throw around the word AI for Earth before solving all these challenges. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>